Thank you, Shami. It is an honor to be introduced by you. Thank you for all of your courageous and wonderful work. I also want to thank Jude Kelly. It's so good to be back at the South Bank Center. Uh, and Jacqueline Rose for extending the original invitation. And I wish to acknowledge that with us here tonight is Miriam Saeed, who shared her life with Edward, was his great collaborator, and carries his work forward in so many ways. The focus of my talk tonight is the climate crisis and the central role that systems that rank the relative value of human beings, including but not limited to white supremacy, patriarchy, and Orientalism, have played in deepening that crisis. Before I get into all of that, I should acknowledge that it may seem slightly strange for an Edward Said Memorial Lecture to focus on an environmental topic. Said, as some of you are aware, was not known as a tree hugger. Descended from traders, artisans, and professionals, he once described himself as an extreme case of an urban Palestinian whose relationship to the land is basically metaphorical. In After the Last Sky, Said's powerful meditation on the photographs of Jean Moore, he explored the most intimate aspects of Palestinian lives, from hospitality to sports to home decor, the tiniest detail, the placement of a photograph, the defiant posture of a child, provoked a torrent of insight from Said. But when confronted with images of Palestinian farmers tending to their flocks, working the fields, this specificity evaporated. Which crops were being cultivated, the state of the soil, the state of the water supply, mysteriously gone. Said confessed, I continue to perceive a population of poor, suffering, occasionally colorful peasants, unchanged and collective, though he acknowledged that this perception was bas basically mythic. Um, if farming was another wor world for Edward Said, those who devoted their lives to issues like air and water pollution basically seemed to occupy another planet. Speaking to his colleague, Rob Nixon, he once described environmentalism, this is Edward Said, as, quote, the indulgence of spoiled tree huggers who lack a proper cause. <laughs> now, in preparation for this lecture, I spoke to Rob Nixon, uh, and we both agreed that this remark required some context. The environmental challenges of the Middle East are impossible to ignore for anyone immersed in that region's geopolitics, as Edward Said, of course, was. This is a region intensely vulnerable to heat and water stress, to sea level rise and desertification. A recent paper in the journal Nature Climate Change predicts that unless we radically lower our emissions and fast, by the end of this century, large parts of the Middle East will likely, and this is a quote, experience temperature levels that are intolerable to humans. Now, Climate scientists aren't known for being direct. Um, this is about as blunt as they get. Yet despite this, environmental issues in the region tend to still be seen as a luxury. And the reason is not ignorance and it's not indifference. It's just bandwidth. Climate change is a grave threat, but it's most frightening in the medium term. And there are always more pressing short-term concerns to deal with, like military occupation, air assault, systemic discrimination, embargo. Nothing can or should compete with that. There are other reasons why environmentalism might have looked to Said like a bourgeois playground. The Israeli state has long coded its nation-building project in a green veneer. In fact, this has been a key part of the Zionist back-to-the-land pioneer ethos. And in this context, trees specifically have been among the most potent weapons of land grabbing and occupation. It's not only the countless olive and pistachio groves that have been uprooted to make way 
for settlements and Israeli-only roads, you see here a photograph of someone who is not your typical tree hugger, I think you will agree. It's also the sprawling pine and eucalyptus forests that have been planted over those orchards, as well as over Palestinian villages, most notoriously by the Jewish National Fund, known as the JNF. Under its slogan, Turning the Desert Green, the JNF boasts of having planted 250 million trees in Israel since 1901, many of them non-native to the region. In publicity materials, the JNF bills itself as just another green NGO, concerned with forest and water management, parks and recreation. It also happens to be the largest private landowner in the state of Israel, and despite a number of complicated legal challenges, it still refuses to lease or sell land to non-Jews. Now, I grew up in a Jewish community where every occasion, births and deaths, Mother's Day, bar mitzvahs, were marked with the proud purchase of JNF trees in that person's honor. It wasn't until adulthood that I began to understand that those feel-good, faraway conifers which certificates for which uh, were papered the walls of my Montreal elementary school were not merely benign, not just something to plant and later hug. In fact, these trees are among the most glaring symbols of Israel's system of official discrimination, the one that must be dismantled if peaceful coexistence is to become possible. The JNF is an extreme and recent example of what some call green colonialism. But the phenomenon is hardly new, nor is it unique to Israel. There's a long and painful history in the Americas of beautiful pieces of wilderness turned into conservation parks, and then and that designation being used to prevent indigenous people from accessing their ancestral territories to hunt and fish, or to live, for that matter. It has happened again and again. A contemporary version of this phenomenon is the carbon offset. Indigenous people from Brazil to Uganda find that some of the most aggressive land grabbing today is being done by conservation organizations. A forest is suddenly rebranded a carbon offset that allows us to continue to pollute in countries like Britain, and it is put off limits to its traditional inhabitants. As a result, the carbon offset market has created a new class of green human rights abuses, with farmers and indigenous people being physically attacked at times by park rangers and private security when they try to access their lands. So these comments about tree huggers, I think, should be seen in this context and in this history. And there's more. The last year of Edward Said's life, uh, Israel was building the so-called separation barrier. It was going up, seizing huge swaths of the West Bank, cutting Palestinian workers off from their jobs, farmers from their fields, patients from hospitals, and often brutally dividing families. There was no shortage of reasons to oppose that wall on human rights grounds. Yet at the time, some of the loudest dissenting voices among Israeli Jews were not focused on any of these issues. Rather, Israel's then environment minister, Yehudit Naot, worried about a report that informed her that, quote, the separation fence is harmful to the landscape, the flora and fauna, the ecological corridors, and the drainage of the creeks. I certainly don't want to stop or delay the building of the fence, she said, but I'm disturbed by the environmental damage involved. As Palestinian Activist and author Omar Barghouti later observed, Naot's ministry in the National Parks Protection Authority mounted diligent rescue efforts to save an affected reserve of irises by moving it to an alternative reserve. They've also created tiny passages through the wall for animals. Perhaps this best puts that cynicism about the green movement in context. People do tend to get cyn cynical when their lives are treated as less important than flowers and reptiles. And yet, and yet there is so much of Saeed's intellectual legacy that both illuminates and clarifies the underlying causes of the global ecological crisis. <laughs>
so much indeed that points how we might respond in ways that are far more inclusive than so many current campaign models. That do not ask suffering people to shelve their concerns about war, poverty, and systemic racism, and first save the world, but instead demonstrate how all of these crises are interconnected and how the solutions can be as well. In short, Edward Said may have had no time for tree huggers, but tree huggers must urgently make time for Edward Said and for a great many other key anti-imperialist and post-colonial thinkers. Because there is no way to understand how we ended up in this dangerous place, nor to grasp the transformations required to get us out. So what follows are some thoughts, by no means complete, about what we can learn from reading Edward Said in a warming world. He was and remains among our most achingly eloquent theorists of exile and homesickness. But Said's homesickness, he was always made clear, was for a home that had been so radically altered that it no longer really existed. His was a complex position. He fiercely defended the right of return, but never claimed that home was fixed. Was ma what mattered was the principle of respecting all human rights equally, that restorative justice must inform all of our actions and policies. This perspective is deeply relevant in our time of fast eroding coastlines, of nations disappearing beneath the rising seas, of coral reefs that sustain entire cultures bleached white, of a balmy Arctic. Because longing for a radically altered homeland, a homeland that may not even exist any longer, is a state that is being rapidly and tragically globalized. James Hansen, perhaps the most respected climate scientist in the world, formerly of NASA, published a paper recently, a very alarming paper about sea level rise, in which he warns that on our current emission trajectory, we face the quote, loss of all coastal cities, most of the world's large cities, and all of their history, and not in thousands of years, as previous models had suggested, but this century, unless we act very quickly. A world of people searching for a home that no longer exists. That is where we are headed if we don't demand radical change. And Saeed helps us imagine what that might look like as well. He helped to popularize the Arabic word sumud, sumud, I think I'm saying it wrong, to stay put, to hold on. That steadfast refusal to leave one's land despite the most desperate eviction attempts and even when surrounded by continuous danger. It's a word most associated with places like Hebron and Gaza, but it could be applied equally today to residents of coastal Louisiana who have had to raise their homes on stilts so that they don't have to evacuate, or to Pacific Islanders whose slogan is, we are not drowning, we're fighting. In countries like the Marshall Islands and Fiji and Tuvalu, they know that so much sea level rise is already locked in that their countries probably don't have a future, but they refuse to simply concern themselves with the logistics of relocation even if there were safer countries willing to open their borders, which is a very big if, considering that climate refugees currently have no recognition under international law. But as you see here, um, instead they are actively resisting, blockading Australian coal ships with traditional outrigger canoes, disrupting international climate negotiations with their inconvenient presence, demanding far more aggressive climate action. If there is anything worth celebrating in the Paris Agreement signed last month, and unfortunately there isn't enough worth celebrating, it is because of this kind of principled climate action, what we might call climate sumud. But this only scratches the surface of what we can learn from reading Said in a warming world. He was, of course, the giant in the study of othering, what he described in Orientalism as disregarding, essentializing, denuding the humanity of another culture, people, 
or geographical region. And once the other has been firmly established, the ground is softened for any transgression, violent expulsion, land theft, occupation, invasion, because of course the whole point of othering is that the other does not have the same rights, the same humanity that the people doing the othering have. So what does this have to do with the climate crisis? Maybe everything. Because we have dangerously warmed our world already, and our governments still refuse to take the actions necessary to halt this trend. There was a time when most of us could have claimed ignorance, but for the past three decades, ever since the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was formed, ever since our governments started needing to negotiate emission reductions, we have lost all plausible deniability. This has been done with the full awareness of the dangers. The point is that this kind of recklessness would have been functionally impossible without institutionalized racism, however latent, without Orientalism, without all the potent tools on offer that allow the powerful to discount the lives of the less powerful. These tools are what allow for the writing off of entire nations and ancient cultures like those Pacific Islands. And there's something else too. These tools of ranking the relative value of humans are what allowed for the digging up of all of that carbon to begin with. Now, fossil fuels are not the sole driver of climate change, so is industrial agriculture, so is deforestation, but they are the largest single driver of climate change. And the thing about fossil fuels is that they're so inherently dirty and toxic that they require sacrificial people and sacrificial places. They always have. People whose lungs and bodies could be sacrificed to work in the coal mines. People whose land and water can be sacrificed to open pit mining and oil spills. As recently as the 1970s, government documents openly referred to certain parts of the United States as national sacrifice areas. Places like the mountains of Appalachia blasted off for coal mining because so-called mountaintop removal, as this practice is called, is cheaper than digging holes underground to dig up that coal. And to sacrifice an entire region, to blow up their mountains, there must be theories of othering to justify it. And how the people, about how the people who lived there were so poor and so backwards, their lives and culture didn't deserve protecting. After all, if you're a hillbilly, who cares about your hills? Turning all that coal into electricity required another layer of othering, this one for the urban populations that would live next door to the power plants and the refineries. In North America, these are overwhelmingly communities of color, black and Latino, forced to carry the toxic burden of our collective addiction to fossil fuels with markedly higher rates of respiratory illnesses like asthma and cancer clusters. It was in fights like this that the term environmental racism was born and the climate justice movement ultimately was born. These fossil fuel sacrifice zones dot the globe, like the Niger Delta, poisoned by an Exxon Valdez worth of spilled oil every single year. A process that Ken Sarawiwa, before he was murdered by his government, called ecological genocide. The executions of community leaders, he said, were all for shell. In my country, Canada, the decision to dig up the Alberta tar sands, a particularly heavy form of oil that needs to be mined, has required the shredding of treaties with First Nations, treaties signed with the British Crown that guaranteed Indigenous people the right to continue to hunt and fish and lead traditional lives on their ancestral lands. It required it because these rights are meaningless when the land is desecrated. This is uh, an image of a before and after image of the boreal forest after tar sands mining. It required it because these rights are meaningless when the land is being unmade like this, when the rivers are being polluted and the moose and the fish are riddled with tumors. And it gets worse because, as you may have heard in the news just today, Fort McMurray, the town at the dead center of the tar sands boom 
where so many of the workers who do that mining live and where much of the money um, is spent is currently in an infernal blaze. It's that hot and that dry. The whole place, the whole town of Fort McMurray is currently under evacuation and that may have a little something to do with what is being mined there. Even without that kind of dramatic event though, this kind of resource extraction is a form of violence, what Rob Nixon calls slow violence, because it does so much damage to the land and water that it means the end of a way of life, a death of cultures that are inseparable from the land. Severing indigenous people's connection to the land used to be state policy in my country, imposed through the forcible removal of indigenous children from their families, sent to boarding schools where their languages and cultural practices were banned and where physical and sexual abuse were rampant. A recent Truth and Reconciliation study report called it genocide. The trauma associated with these layers of forced separation from land, from culture, from family is directly linked to the epidemic of despair ravaging so many First Nations communities today. And I think this too may have made the news over here. Maybe you heard about the community of Attawapiskat, a small community of 2,000 people, where on a single Saturday night last month, 11 people tried to take their own lives. Meanwhile, De Beers runs a diamond mine on the community's traditional territory. Like all extractive projects, it had promised hope and opportunity. Why don't the people just leave? This is what the politicians and the pundits ask in the face of this suicide epidemic, and many do. And that departure is linked in part to the thousands of indigenous women in Canada who have been murdered and gone missing, many in large cities. The connection between violence against women and violence against the land, often to extract resources like fossil fuels, this connection is rarely made in press reports, but it's there. Every new government comes to power promising a new era of respectful relations with indigenous people, of respecting indigenous rights, and they don't deliver. They don't deliver because indigenous rights include the right to refuse extractive projects. That is what is in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, uh, the, 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 the right to informed consent. The right to refuse even when those projects fuel national economic growth, and that's a problem because growth is our culture, it's our religion, it's our way of life. So even Canada's hunky and charming new prime minister is bound and determined to build new tar sands pipelines, to build them against the express wishes of indigenous communities who have said, no, we will not risk our water, we will not participate in the further destabilizing of the climate. Fossil fuels require sacrifice zones, they always have, and they still do. And you don't have a system built on sacrificial places and sacrificial people unless intellectual theories exist that justify their sacrifice. And those theories still persist from Manifest Destiny to Terra Nullius to Orientalism, from backwards hillbillies to backwards Indians. The theories of othering survive despite all the lip service paid to political correctness because they are so very useful, because they are so very profitable, because they are inextricable from capitalism, inextricable from extractivism, and now inextricable from climate change. And this brings us to another crucial point. You know, we often hear climate change blamed on human nature, on the inherent greed and short-sightedness of our species. Or we'll t we're told that we have altered the earth so much uh, and on such a planetary scale that we are now living in the Anthropocene, the age of humans. These ways of explaining our current circumstances are saying something very specific, if unspoken. They're saying that humans are one thing, that human nature can be essentialized to the traits that created this culture. And in so doing, the systems that certain humans created and other humans powerfully resisted and resist still are let completely off the hook. Systems like 
capitalism, colonialism, patriarchy, those sorts of systems. And there is something else these diagnoses tend to do. They erase the very real existence of other human systems that organize life very differently. Systems that insist that humans must think seven generations in the future, that we must not only be good citizens but good ancestors, must take no more than we need and give back to protect the lands and the systems of regeneration. Those systems existed and exist still and they are erased every time we say that the climate crisis is one of human nature and that we are living in something called the age of man. And they are systems that come under very real attack when mega projects are being built, not just in the past, but today, taking the lives of land defenders like Berta Caceres, assassinated in Honduras just two months ago, leading indigenous resistance against a hydro project. Now some say it doesn't have to be this bad. We can clean up resource extraction. It doesn't have to look like it does in Honduras or the Niger Delta or even the Alberta tar sands, except for the fact that we are running out of easy and cheap ways to get at fossil fuels. And that's why we've seen the rise of technologies like fracking and the mining of this heavy fuel in northern Alberta called tar sands in the first place. And this, in turn, is starting to challenge that original Faustian uh, bargain at the center of the industrial age, this idea that the heaviest risks would be outsourced, offloaded, onto the other, the periphery within our own countries and in other countries. That's becoming less and less possible. Fracking is threatening some of the most picturesque parts of Britain, which has caused an uprising in this country. The sacrifice zone is expanding, swallowing up all kinds of places that imagine themselves safe. So this is not just about gasping at how ugly the Alberta tar sands are. It's about acknowledging that there is no clean, safe, non-toxic way to run an economy powered by fossil fuels, and there never was. There's also an avalanche of evidence showing that there is no peaceful way to do it either. The trouble is structural. Fossil fuels, unlike renewable forms of energy like wind and solar, are not widely distributed. They are highly concentrated in very specific locations. And, well, those locations have a bad habit of being under other people's countries and other people's sands, particularly that most potent and precious of fossil fuels, oil which is why the project of Orientalism, of othering Arab and Muslim people, has been the silent partner of our oil dependence from the start, an inextricable, and inextricably, therefore, part of the blowback that is climate change. Because if nations and people are regarded as other, exotic, primitive, bloodthirsty, as Edward Said documented back in the 1970s, it is far easier to wage wars and stage coups when they get this crazy idea that they should control their own oil for their own interests. Again and again and again, in 1953, it was the British and US collaboration to overthrow the democratically elected government of Mohammed Mossadegh after he nationalized the Anglo-Iranian oil company, now BP. In 2003, exactly 50 years later, it was another US-UK co-production, the illegal invasion and occupation of Iraq. The reverberations of each intervention continue to jolt our world, as do the reverberations from the successful burning of all that oil. And nowhere more so than in the Middle East itself, a region that is now squeezed in the pincer of violence caused by fossil fuels on the one hand, the quest for fossil fuels on the one hand, and the impacts of burning those fossil fuels on the other. <clears throat> The Israeli architect, Eyal Weissman, has a groundbreaking take on how these forces are intersecting in his latest book, The Conflict Shoreline. He explains that the main way, he explains that the main way we've understood the border in, uh, of the desert in the Middle East and North Africa is a so-called aridity line. These are lines indicating an average 200 millimeters of rainfall per year. 
That's been considered the minimum for growing cereal crops on a large scale without irrigation. So we're looking here at two key aridity lines uh, in this graphic, and, and, and Weitzman generously shared this with me, and he was hoping to be here tonight, but he wasn't able to be. Uh, so these meteorological boundaries are not fixed. There are, there's always fluctuations within them, whether it's Israel's attempts to green the desert, which pushes the aridity line in one direction, or cyclical drought in this region that pushes it in the other. And now, with climate change, intensifying drought is having all kinds of impacts along, along these lines. Weitzman points out that the Syrian border city of, Dur of Dura, which I think you see there, falls directly on the aridity line. That's where Syria's deepest drought on record brought huge numbers of displaced farmers in the years leading up to the outbreak of Syria's civil war. It's also where the Syrian uprising broke out in 2011. <clears throat> Drought was not the only factor bringing tensions to a head, as we all know. But the fact that 1.5 million people were internally displaced in Syria clearly exacerbated the tensions. This is something that is not controversial to say. John Kerry has said it on numerous occasions. This connection between water stress and conflict is a recurring pattern along the aridity line. If you look at some of the names we've put on the map, you will see some familiar ones from Libya to Gaza, some of the bloodiest battlefields in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Now check this out. Weitzman discovered what he calls an astounding coincidence. When you map the targets of Western drone strikes onto this region, if you can just do that, you see, and here I'm quoting him, that many of these attacks from South Waziristan through Northern Yemen, Somalia, Mali, Iraq, Gaza, and Libya are directly on or close to the 200 millimeter aridity line. So those red dots represent some of the areas where drone strikes have been most concentrated. I was really struck when I saw this image, and this is why I wanted to share it with you, because I think it's the most striking attempt yet to visualize the brutal landscape of the climate crisis. Speaking of aridity. <laughs> so, some of this was foreshadowed a decade ago in a U.S. military report published by the Center for Naval Analyses. And many people have pointed out, though, that although there is a high degree of climate change denial in the United States, particularly among Republicans, um, the U.S. military has been talking openly about this for a long time. So this is a 2007 report. And it makes the, the following rather stark observation. The Middle East has always been associated with two natural resources, oil because of its abundance and water because of its scarcity. Uh, so I thought that was a, an apt quote. It's true enough. And now certain patterns are quite clear. First, Western fighter jets followed that abundance of oil. Now Western drones are closely shadowing the lack of water as drought exacerbates conflict in the region. And the story doesn't end there, because just as bombs follow oil and drones follow drought, so do boats follow both. Boats filled with refugees, fleeing homes ravaged by war and drought all along the aridity line. And that same capacity for dehumanizing the other, the one that justifies the bombs and the drones, is now being trained as you know, on these migrants, casting their need for security as a threat to ours, their desperate flight as some sort of invading army. So of course, we are now seeing a migration of a more brutal sort, tactics honed on the West Bank and in other occupation zones, making their way to North America and Europe. In selling his wall on the border with Mexico, Donald Trump likes to say, ask Israel, the wall works. Camps are bulldozed in Calais. Thousands of people drown in the Mediterranean. The Australian government detains survivors of war and despotic regimes in camps on remote islands like Nauru and Manus. Conditions are so desperate on Nauru that last week, an Iranian migrant died after setting himself on fire to draw, try to draw the world's attention. Just two days ago on Monday, 
Another migrant, a 21-year-old woman from Somalia, set herself on fire on Nauru. Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull warns that Australians cannot be misty-eyed about this and have to be very clear and determined in our national purpose. It's something to keep in mind the next time a columnist in a, at a Murdoch paper declares, as one Katie Hopkins did last year, that it's time for Britain to get Australian, quote, bring on the gunships, force migrants back to their shores, and burn the boats, unquote. Nauru, incidentally, is one of the Pacific Islands very vulnerable to sea level rise. Its residents, after seeing their home turned into a prison for others, will very possibly have to migrate themselves. So how is that for symbolism? Tomorrow's climate refugees recruited into service as today's prison guards. What is happening on that island and what is happening to that island are, I believe, expressions of the same logic. Why? Because a culture that places so little value on black and brown lives that it is willing to let human beings disappear beneath the waves or set themselves on fire in detention camps is also going to be willing to let countries where black and brown people live disappear beneath the waves or desiccate in the arid heat. And when that happens, theories of human hierarchy and taking care of our own first will be marshaled to rationalize these monstrous decisions. In truth, we are already doing it if only implicitly. We do it because though climate change will ultimately be an existential threat to all of humanity in the short term, we know that it does discriminate, that it does hit the poor first and worst, whether they're abandoned on rooftops in New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina, or right now in Southern and East Africa where 36 million people face hunger due to drought, according to the UN. 36 million. This is an emergency, not a future emergency, a present emergency, a five alarm fire. But in this country and mine, we aren't acting like it. The Paris Agreement, the much celebrated Paris Agreement, commits to keeping warming below two degrees Celsius. That is double the warming that is already causing these types of impacts, double of what we've already done. It's beyond reckless. When that target of two degrees warming was first unveiled in 2009 in Copenhagen, the African delegates walked out of the sessions en masse and said that it was a death sentence for their continent, that they couldn't survive it. The island nations said we needed to keep warming below 1.5 for them to survive. Their slogan has become 1.5 to stay alive. At the last minute, a clause was added to the Paris Agreement that says countries will, quote, pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Pursue efforts. This is not exactly binding stuff. And we are making no such efforts. The same governments that made these promises went home, pushed fracking like your government, pushed tar sands pipelines like my government, Development projects that are completely incompatible with meeting a two degree temperature target, let alone a 1.5 target. And this is happening for a cruel and crass reason, because the wealthiest people in the wealthiest countries in the world think they're going to be okay, think someone else is going to have to eat the risk, think that even when climate change comes to our doorsteps, they're going to be taken care of. And when it does come, that's when things start to get really ugly. We had a glimpse of this when the floodwaters rose in England last December and January, inundating 16,000 homes. Now, these communities weren't only dealing with Britain's wettest December on record. They were also coping with the fact that your austerity-crazed government has waged a relentless attack on the public sphere, including the agencies and the councils on the front lines of flood defense. So understandably, there were many who wanted to change the subject from that abject failure, away from the manufactured crisis of austerity, away from the money lost to overseas tax havens. And where did they change the subject to? Of course, they changed them to 
the usual other. This could have been a moment to understand human connection and interdependence, that we are all impacted by climate change, that wealth and skin color offers little protection, that we must take action in solidarity with one another. Instead, that hierarchy of humanity that has been a partner to warming from the start reared its head yet again. Why, they asked, is Britain spending so much money on refugees and foreign aid when it should be taking care of its own? Never mind foreign aid, we heard in the, in the Daily Mail, what about national aid? Why, demanded a Telegraph editorial, should British taxpayers continue to pay for flood defenses abroad when the money is needed at home? Maybe because you guys invented the steam engine, but that's a whole other, <laughs> that's a whole other question. Okay. Um, This is what we must always remember. Climate change is not just about things getting hotter and wetter, though it's about that too. It's also about things getting meaner and uglier unless we change these corrosive values at the center of this economic and political system that pits us against one another. What can we learn from all of this? I think the most important lesson is that there is absolutely no way to confront the climate crisis as a technocratic problem in isolation from everything else as we've been trying to do for so long. It must be seen in the context of austerity and privatization, of colonialism and militarism, and of the various systems of othering needed to sustain all of it. The connections and intersections are clear, glaring, and yet so often, the resistance is highly compartmentalized and siloed still. The anti-austerity people rarely talk about climate change. The climate change people rarely talk about war and occupation. Seldom do we make the connections between the guns that take black lives on the streets of the United States and in police custody and the much larger forces that annihilate so many black lives on arid land and in precarious boats around the world. Overcoming these disconnections, finding and strengthening the threads of connection between all of our various issues and movements is, I would argue, the most pressing task of anyone preoccupied with social and economic justice. It is the only way to build counter power sufficiently robust and motivated to win against the forces protecting this highly profitable but increasingly discredited and untenable status quo. I've been describing the ways that climate change acts as an accelerant to many of our social ills, inequality, wars, racism, but by the same token, and this is what I argue and this changes everything, it can also be an accelerant for the opposite, for the forces working for social and economic justice and against militarism. Indeed, the climate crisis, by presenting our species with an existential crisis and putting us on a firm and unyielding science-based deadline, might just be the catalyst we need to knit together a great many powerful movements, bound together by a belief in the inherent worth and value of all people, united by a rejection of the sacrifice zone mentality, whether it is applied to people or to places, by the understanding that we face so many overlapping and intersecting crises that we cannot fix them sequentially. We need integrated solutions. We need to design and fight for policies that radically bring down emissions, create huge numbers of well-paying jobs that pay a living wage, that are, are unionized, and that bring justice to the sacrifice zones, to the front lines of climate impacts, First of all, we need to do this between countries and within our countries. In Canada, I've been part of a project that we call the LEAP Manifesto, which articulates what these policies must be. And one of, one of our demands is that we want energy democracy as we switch from fossil fuels to renewable energy. We don't want to just be buying renewable energy from Shell and Exxon. We want communities to own and control their own renewable energy projects, and we want indigenous communities and other frontline communities who have gotten the worst deal in the current extractive economy to be first in line to own and control their own renewable energy projects. That's energy justice, that is energy reparations. 
Those who knew Saeed well observed that at the end of his life, he was increasingly concerned about ecological issues. He died the year Iraq was invaded, living to see its libraries and museums looted while its oil ministry was faithfully guarded. Amidst these outrages, he found hope in the global anti-war movement, as well as from new forms of grassroots communication opened up by technology. <clears throat> he described it like this, the existence of alternative communities across the globe informed by alternative news sources and keenly aware of the environmental, human rights, and libertarian impulses that bind us together on this tiny planet. You will note that his vision even had a place for tree huggers. I was reminded of these words recently when I was reading up on England's recent floods. And amidst all the scapegoating and finger pointing in the corporate press, I came across a post by a man named Liam Cox. He was upset by the way some in the media were using the disaster to, royal, to, royal up anti, sorry, to rile up anti-foreigner sentiment. He used words somewhat coarser than one might expect at a lecture in honor of the impeccably erudite Edward Said, but I think they belong here nonetheless. Here is what Mr. Cox wrote. I live in Hemded Bridge, Yorkshire, one of the worst affected areas hit by the floods. It's shit. Everything has gotten really wet. However, I'm alive. I'm safe. My family are safe. We don't live in fear. I'm free. There aren't bullets flying around. There aren't bombs going off. I'm not being forced to flee my home, and I'm not being shunned by the richest countries in the world or criticized by its residents. <clears throat> All of you morons vomiting your xenophobia about how much money should be, about how money should only be spent on our own need to look at yourselves closely in the mirror. I request you ask yourselves a very important question. Am I a decent and honorable human being? <laughs> because home isn't just the UK. Home is everywhere on this planet. I think that makes for a fine last word. Thank you. Thank you.